Hi, I'm Ian Bremmer, and welcome to the G Zero World podcast, where you can usually find extended versions of the interviews that I conduct with world leaders and game changers on my global politics public television series by the same name. Today, though, I've got something a bit different for you. I'd like to share a short clip from another great podcast out there called Cafe Insider. It's co-hosted by former U.S. Attorney Preet Bharara and former New Jersey Attorney General Ann Milgram. It's part of Cafe's membership program, which I highly recommend. Here's why. We're living through historic times, and the whirlwind news cycle leaves us with more questions than answers. It's hard to know what's going on in Washington and across the country. Cafe Insider is a podcast that makes good sense of what's happening. Each week, former Southern District of New York U.S. Attorney and good friend Preet Bharara, a guest on this show and someone I know pretty well, is joined by former New Jersey Attorney General Ann Milgram, and they break down politically charged legal issues making the headlines. From news about impeachment to the latest Justice Department investigations, Preet and Ann bring expertise, perspective, and occasionally even humor to help people understand the news shaping America's future. The podcast is part of the Cafe Insider membership, which includes a weekly newsletter featuring essays by Preet, quarterly conference calls, easy access to events, and more. And today, we're sharing a sample from this week's episode of the Insider Podcast. To listen to the full episode, become a member, and get access to all exclusive Cafe Insider content, you can do that at cafe.com slash insider. That's cafe.com slash insider. So now let's get to this big blockbuster Inspector General report that we were going to begin the show with. The report is entitled, Review of Four FISA Applications and Other Aspects of the FBI's Crossfire Hurricane Investigation. Crossfire Hurricane was the code name for what we colloquially call the Russia investigation that then led into the, to the Mueller investigation. Top line, uh, bottom line, conclusion. Top line is a top, it's difference between a top line and a bottom line. It occurs to me, they, they, <laughs> no. seem, seem like they mean kind of the same thing. <laughs> That's yeah. a, what a revelation in this, in this moment. Um, I'm sorry the listeners had to, had to hear me have to that, experience that, with that epiphany in, in real time. Um, but, but the central theme is that that entire investigation was properly predicated. It was opened properly. It was not based on partisan bias or discriminatory intent or anything like that. And the report says very clearly... Quote, we did not find documentary or testimonial evidence that political bias or improper motivation influenced the decisions. Close quote. So there's no improper purpose. Obama had no role. People weren't trying to screw anyone. That's important because it belies months and months and months of talking points from the mouth of the president of the United States, his allies, and people like Bill Barr. On the other hand, the report also found, troublingly, that there were a lot of mistakes and errors especially in connection with the application for a FISA warrant on Carter Page. I think they found 17 different kinds of errors. Yeah, related to the four FISA applications on, on Carter Page. And so my high-level takeaway, and, and I, I... It's a top line or bottom line? <laughs> it's, it's a very complicated question. I'm going to go top line today. Okay. Um, my headline, the, the sort of bumper sticker on this is that the president has spent the past two years talking about um, treason and accusing people of spying on his campaign and saying that there was illegal surveillance. And this has been one of the, you know, one of the president's main themes. What the report said yesterday, and this is critically important, not just for the fact that the president was not truthful about that, but also for the institutions like the FBI that we rely upon to be law enforcement agencies in our country and which have enormous power to actually engage in surveillance and things like that. What the report says is there's no treason, there's no spying, there's no illegal surveillance. There was a proper and lawful basis to open this investigation. There was no political bias or other bias that they could find against the president. And it looks at the text messages between Lisa Page and Peter struck. It looks at the involvement of Andy McCabe, Jim Comey. And and so what it's really saying is this was not a political investigation. And it dissects that in a way where I think it's critically important for people to understand. They pulled 
every email, every text message. They interviewed everyone who was involved, and they didn't find any evidence that bias in any way impacted this investigation. And that's really important because all Americans should be able to believe that when the FBI starts investigating someone, asking questions, one of the agents right after the conversation in Russia that George Papadopoulos has with an Australian diplomat, that's actually what leads to the opening of this investigation. Not the Steele affidavit. Not the Steele affidavit that they learn of weeks later, but it's this conversation. One of the agents goes to Australia to interview that diplomat. And so it's important for Americans to understand that this investigation was legitimately opened and conducted. All that is critical. The second point, which is a slightly different, but but a really important point, is that the report found that the way the FBI conducted this investigation, that there were errors and mistakes. And I've done these hot washes, right? I don't know if you did them when you were U.S. attorney, but when I was AG, something would go wrong with the state police or we oversaw the Camden Police Department and the law enforcement folks call it a hot wash and they come in and they go through everything of what went wrong, why did it go wrong, where did the process fail us? And this is a really important thing to do. And then depending on what happens, you make changes. I, I would call them, I, we did postmortems on, on everything. We did postmortems when things went well. Right. Why, why did that go well? Was it because we did things correctly because we were prepared or did we get lucky? Yes. And, then, and, and sometimes the outcome is not, right, you have to separate the process from the outcome. Sometimes the outcome is a good one, even if you have a bad process, but sometimes it's a bad one. And yes, you have to go back and look at these things. And there were a couple of things that I think are worth just noting so people understand what kinds of errors we're talking about. The inspector general also made recommendation a recommendation that this is was so sensitive and so high level that there should have been some Department of Justice involvement, and there there was not. That this was done by the FBI on its own and really independently in a way where the FBI is independent, but the inspector general suggested you should get people involved and have these conversations. But thinking about the errors and and what they sort of come from. There were, the, with the Carter Page FISA application, and it's really important for folks to, it, it, these reports are also long, even the executive summary is long, so I know a lot of folks won't read it, but- We have you. Well, yes, we have, we have <laughs> us doing it. They went through and they basically identified that Carter Page was the subject of an investigation. He had been an asset for um, the, the Washington Post reports for, um, most likely for the CIA. He had a lot of involvement with Russians. And so he, he was a known quantity. There was an existing investigation at the time this stuff all came up. So it sort of puts you in the understanding of the mindset that, hey, there might be something going on here with this guy, which is why the FBI looks at him. They then have the Steele dossier, and where the the report really raises issues is that over time they come to understand that aspects of the Steele dossier are not corroborated. There's something written in the FISA affidavit that makes it appear that a lot of Steele's testimony and information that he's previously provided, because he was a source, for, it was a human source for the FBI from 2013 to 2016, it makes it seem like a lot of that has been used in trials and has been substantiated, upheld when, in truth, he'd given some information about the FIFA, the world soccer scandals. Not a lot of it was used. It wasn't highly corroborated. And so they made him out... They they bolstered him. They made him out to be better than he was. They also simultaneously had individuals who'd spoken with um, with Page and Papadopoulos who'd made exculpatory statements, things that made it look like there were, they were not engaged in problematic behavior. You know, um, I think Papadopoulos or Page at one point said, we're not getting dirt from the Russians. So that's the kind of thing that you would expect to find in an application to a court, the good and the bad called evenly. And some of that was missing. And even as there came to be revelations about issues with the Steele dossier, that wasn't incorporated into future versions of, FI of the FISA report. And there are some other things, but it's really important to say this, that these things have to be well done, that the good and the bad has to be told equally to a court. And so the fact that these issues were raised, again, they weren't those mistakes. They didn't find political bias. Yeah, pe people make mistakes because they're human beings, as Jim Comey wrote about. And we'll talk about various people's reactions to the report. But one reason that I think is well-based as to why the, the inspector general is so harsh about these mistakes is something that you and I both experienced, right? You like to think in an ideal world that the people who work in law enforcement do a perfect job on a big case, on a sensitive case, and also on a less sensitive case, you know, a small case that's not going to be in, on the front page of the papers. But humans being who they are, it just it doesn't often work out that way. That when you have a very sensitive case, people are more attuned to the fact that errors will be magnified and the office can be besmirched in its reputation. Uh, and there are more layers of review. You know, people would say sometimes to me, you know, when you're prosecuting a big deal, 
public official, is there a different standard of proof you apply to them? And I said, no, there's no different standard of proof. It's beyond a reasonable doubt or probable cause at the indictment stage. But the way life works and the way organizations work is you have a lot more eyes. You have a lot more reviewing. I would personally read, and as I'm sure you did, in sensitive cases, I would personally get involved. I would have the prosecutors in. We would talk to the agents, look at every T and every I, make sure they're crossed and dotted. And there's just a higher level of attention because you can afford a mistake just to the way the world works less. And so the surprise, you know, the, the tone of surprise in the report makes sense to me that in a case that was so significant and so sensitive and involving, you know, the stakes that, that were involved, the frequency of mistakes is kind of, you know, notable. Yeah, it makes you wonder what happens with the other cases. I mean, your your point is well taken. The other thing the inspector general talks about is, you know, these were three handpicked teams and there were mistakes in all of them. And he... Michael Horowitz, the inspector general, he's critical of not just the agents, but also the supervisors and whether or not the oversight of, of the investigation was properly done. I think it's worth noting, too, that the inspector general is concerned about this. I think Susan Hennessy did this yesterday, who writes for the Lawfare blog, did a good job of saying, you know, in the Mueller report, which is 460 plus pages, Carter Page is seven pages. So we should all take into consideration the fact that this is not a huge part of the Mueller investigation or ultimately crossfire hurricane. But it's still worth our focusing on this and thinking about you know, we don't know whether the judges would have made a different ruling. We will never know that. You cannot uncrack an egg. And so it's like just one of those things. But why Why the inspector general called them out on this also is that all the mistakes went in one direction. And they went in favor of giving the FBI additional arguments in favor of we have probable cause to do this, to get this FISA warrant issued. Um, and so that's, it's, this is an important this, this is a really important thing. The other thing I would just ask you about is, I thought it was pretty interesting. The FBI director, Chris Ray came out, and he's been, in my view, very good and very strong. And He's, he's, one, of, he's one of the remaining upstanding people look, at a high level in law enforcement in the country. I hate to say it because in some ways I feel like in this moment in time, we're about to probably talk about, I don't know if we're going to talk about Bill Barr and John Durham, but yes, we are. <laughs> we, we've been proven wrong before. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I want to say with Ray, I want to reserve the opportunity to Re revisit your yes, opinion. But he, he came out, he's very strong. They have a ton of changes that they're implementing to yeah, FBI like 40, policy. 40 reforms. Did you see number two? Number two was, we're not going to run high-profile investigations from FBI headquarters yeah. anymore. That, to me, says a lot. They ran this from headquarters. Most investigations are run from field offices. Field offices, yeah. Um, look, I, I, think, I think he's been acting in good faith. I think he's not been parroting you know, some of the talking points of the president. He said some time ago when the allegation was that the president was spied on, there was spying that was happening. He said, that's not true. That didn't happen. His reaction to the IG report was sober and kind of sad. These things can't happen. He took it seriously. Obviously, he gets an advanced, you know, he gets to look at the report in advance. And so he had all these reforms already in place, ready to roll out when the report was finally released to the public. Uh, and he also endorses the bottom line, top line, if you want to call it that that there was no animus or bias. Nonetheless, these other mistakes, figure out ways to make sure they don't, they don't happen again. That's all well and good. Yeah. And just to sum up on that for one second, I do really think it's important because we've now spent a lot of time talking about the errors. It's very common when you do investigations, there are always errors. And I, I want to make sure that everyone understands that there's no perfect world for law enforcement or prosecution. And so this idea that you would be critical of your own work and change policies and procedures is exactly the right one. But the real takeaway of the IG report to me is that there was no political bias or other untoward reason that they started and conducted this investigation. So I just want to bring it back to the sort of core focus, the top and bottom line. So Donald Trump reacted in the moment when the report came out, uh, as, as you might predict, saying it, was, it showed a horrible, horrible conduct, the worst he's ever seen, clearly hasn't read the report, hadn't read it then, probably will never read it. And the same way he said the Mueller report was a total exoneration, he basically says you know, stuff like this about this report, knowing that people aren't going to read it. And they will get their opinions from, you know, like-minded people like Fox News and the President of the United States. But as we were walking to the studio this morning, we saw that Donald Trump, I think for the first time, had something to say about his hand-picked FBI director. Remember, he he may he have said something once Ray. before, a little not not as strong as this, but strong I feel like this isn't the first. But here's what he said today: I don't know what report current current director of the FBI, Christopher Ray, was reading, but it sure wasn't the one given to me. With that kind of attitude, he will never be able to fix the FBI which is badly broken despite having some of the greatest men and women working there. So a lot of people are speculating, well, is Chris Ray on the chopping block? What do you think? <laughs> it certainly doesn't sound great from the tweet, the quote, current director of the FBI. But I think 
Ray has been, he's done a good job. He's been understated. He has not rushed to the microphone here. He had to because the president is attacking the entire organization of the FBI. And he can say what the president says in the tweet saying, yeah, they're great men and women. But he's basically saying the institution is terrible. And so Ray has to stand up and basically say, look, we are not perfect. We're, we have errors. We're going to fix them. But there's no bias. And that's exactly what I believe of the men and women who work here. And so Ray did, I think, what was the right thing to do. He's generally been quiet, though. He has not sought fights with the president. But but he also doesn't, you know, subjugate his own sense of integrity right. and understanding of the truth. For example. I ultimately don't think the president takes him out, though, for a variety of really, reasons. It would be too much right yeah, now. I mean, look, yeah. as people have pointed out, the removal of Jim Comey is what got him the special counsel in the first place. Hopefully he won't repeat that. Look, Chris Ray has opposed a talking point that we kept hearing in the proceedings yesterday in the House that Ukraine was involved in interfering in the 2016 election. He said, I have no evidence to that. I have no evidence of that whatsoever, which is also probably not something that's music to the president's ears. So now let's talk about the two gentlemen you mentioned, <laughs> the yeah. attorney general of the United States, Bill Barr, and the U.S. attorney in Connecticut, John Durham. They, in fairly extraordinary fashion, the moment that really the report- extraordinary. Really extraordinary. Extraordinary, right? extraordinary, extraordinary. Even for you, extraordinary. Yes. Um, triple extraordinary. And I think more extraordinary on the part of the, the U.S. attorney- Agreed. Than, than even the attorney general, who we have seen spin things before in, in a way favorable to the president. The inspector general report, there are sometimes I don't, I don't agree with every single you know, finding and conclusion of an inspector general report, and I've read many, and I've been interviewed for a couple in the past, but it's pretty thorough, it's pretty rigorous, and you kind of let it be. It's kind of the jury renders a verdict, maybe you don't always agree, but you respect it and you move on. Bill Barr put out a, a really interesting statement. Bill Barr's statement yesterday said, quote, the inspector general's report now makes clear that the FBI launched an intrusive investigation of a U.S. presidential campaign on the thinnest of suspicions that, in my view, were insufficient to justify the steps taken. Which is a complete contradiction complete. of what the inspector, his own inspector general, um, you know, rigorous, thoughtful, lengthy inspector general report. What's astonishing is that the inspector general went through all the evidence and basically lays out all the evidence. And Bill Barr just says, no, nope, I read it differently. I'm substituting my judgment. Right. To, and there's no evidence of what Bill Barr says in that report. And why is he doing it? Is he doing it to please the president, to give the president a talking point so they can just disregard? No, they, they will embrace in the report all the conclusions that are negative about the FBI, you know, the 17 mistakes, um, but then reject the thing that they don't find helpful to them. Right. Right. So one thing I was thinking about with Barr yesterday, I was, I was really surprised by Durham's statement. But let me just yep. say, I was not surprised by Barr. I expected him to do something like this. It's outrageous. It is not what the Attorney General of the United States should be doing. There's no evidence for what he said. And again, I mean, he, well, he will say, I guess, and this is why John Durham, who is you know doing his own review of the origins of the investigation, that they're looking at things beyond what the Inspector General looked at, and that evidence is forthcoming. But it's a weird thing to do it now, and to undermine a report because you don't like it. It also gives the impression. That all along, he wanted a particular conclusion. Yes. It, and when it, it doesn't completely. match what he wanted in advance. He's going to say it's wrong. He's going to say it's wrong. And I discredit that. But even to your point about this additional investigation, that in and of itself is bizarre that they're doing this additional investigation. What normally would happen, the inspector general does an investigation. And if there's potential criminal conduct, they refer it, as they did here with the one FBI lawyer. So the, even the fact of Durham's investigation troubles me. But even if we credited that investigation, let's just say for a minute that that's legitimate. They're talking about an ongoing investigation, and they're suggesting that they have additional evidence. In Durham's statement is yeah, basically, quote, I have the utmost respect for the mission of the Office of Inspector General and the comprehensive work that went into the report prepared by Mr. Horowitz and his staff. However, which basically negates the entire prior line, <laughs> that's just Anne saying that. However, our investigation is not limited to developing information from within components of the Department of Justice, which I should note, Anne again speaking here, those are the compartments that actually conducted the investigation and have all the documents and evidence. Durham says our investigation included developing information from other persons and entities, both in the U.S. and outside of the U.S. Based on the evidence collected to date and while our investigation is ongoing, last month we advised the inspector general that we do not agree with some of the report's conclusions as to predication, meaning why they started the investigation and how the FBI case was opened. It's the worst of all worlds, right? He's popping off in the middle of his own investigation. He's undermining something you that you, can see, you never, you ever, never, ever do. do. I mean, I've seen people, the former inspector general from DOJ tweeted this morning that in 30 years since the inspector general's office has been was created, 
He's never seen a statement like that. And you're doing it in a way that you can't even be asked, well, what's the basis for this? Because you're your investigation is ongoing. Yeah, because none of the information is public. You haven't charged anyone. You haven't done anything. Yeah, you haven't was issued he a asked report. to do it? Was he of asked course. to do it? No and, question. And did he not fight back? It just, it's, it's a, it people may not appreciate him. this. Yes. It's a, it's a crazy thing to do. It is really out of the ordinary. Um, it's beyond crazy. It's also wrong. Yeah. And there's a reason why you are prohibited as a DOJ prosecutor from talking about ongoing investigations. And look, I took Comey to task for exactly this in the summer of 2016. What Durham has done here is basically he's in the middle of an investigation. He's suggesting that there's evidence that's contrary to the inspector general's report that he has that nobody else has. Right. And so he doesn't, he's trying to discredit the inspector general's report, which is why almost that first sentence of saying how great the inspector general offends me it's totally enormously. Totally ominous. Before we take off, we can't leave without a quick laughing challenge. Well, too. No, just before we take off, I'm just saying one second. Rudy Giuliani is the kind of guy who is part of a crime scene, and then when there's cops crawling over the crime scene <laughs> and surveillance of the crime scene, he goes back. He in. goes back to the crime scene. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this sample from the Cafe Insider podcast. Become a member at cafe.com/insider. That's cafe.com/insider, and I'll be back soon in your feed with more G Zero World interviews, so keep listening. You're listening to the G Zero World with Ian Bremmer podcast, your weekly geopolitical deep dive into the world's biggest news stories, featuring in-depth conversations with global leaders and newsmakers. To get more of G-Zero's insights on global politics every morning, sign up for our free newsletter, G-Zero Daily, at gzeromedia.com.